Hello everyone and welcome to the Chapter 12 screencast lecture. Let's go ahead and get started. This will be covering the spinal cord and also the spinal nerves that come off of the spinal cord. So this spinal cord is going to start from the opening of the skull, the inferior skull called the foramen magnum. So that region would be right over here. And this is going to extend on down to the second lumbar vertebrae. At that point, we only have lower spinal nerves that will come off here. So we also say that our spinal cord is segmented, which means it has different regions. So the neck region here would all be cervical. And then this um, area in our thorax would be called the thoracic. We have our lumbar region and then we also have our sacral region and our spinal cord is going to give rise to 31 pairs of spinal nerves you can remember that by thinking of 31 flavors at baskin robbins so notice that they're paired so whatever i have on this side we're going to have on the other side everything is symmetrical here although the entire spinal cord is not one long column it's actually uh, it actually has two major enlargements. We have a cervical enlargement, which you see right over here, so it widens a little bit more. And the reason for that is because we have more cell bodies in this region for the neurons that are going to go and supply the upper limbs. And we also have a lumbar enlargement. You can kind of see this a little bit better in here. Um, that it's a widened portion of the spinal cord and that of course is enlarged because it has to give supply to our lower limbs. Now the other thing you could see here is this cone shaped area. That is the conus medullaris. Um, it's just the end of the spinal cord really and that happens at L2 and like I mentioned from there on we have all of these lower spinal nerves and this collectively is called the cauda equina. Cauda meaning tail, equina meaning horse. So an anatomist thought this looked like a horse's tail and named it so. Um, but it's really just the origin of the spinal nerves that are coursing down from the lumbosacral enlargement here. Okay, so quickly on meninges, we'll also touch on this in our chapter 13 lecture. But we have these connective tissue membranes that cover the spinal cord and our brain. And there are three major ones that you need to know. We have our dura mater, which dura means tough, mater means mother. So this is the tough mother, and you can see it on this outer um, periphery here. It really helps to protect the uh, spinal cord and the brain. We also have some folds in the brain, but we won't really be discussing that. But just know that um, it can, uh, it does exist. Um, and then we have our arachnoid mater. For those of you who recognize this word arachnoid, it means spider. So this layer is very much like a spider webby type of meninge. And the last layer is going to be our pia mater. And the pia mater is adhered to the spinal cord, adhered to the brain. You cannot take this off. Now at the bottom, I'm going to switch back real quick. At the bottom of our spinal cord here, right at the conus medullaris, at the very tip, there's one long silvery strand that is going to attach itself to the coccyx bone, and that is called the phylum terminale. So it helps to anchor the spinal cord. Um, we also have denticulate ligaments. Denticulate means tooth-like. So these are tooth-like projections that kind of reach on over and will attach itself um, to the dura mater. Um, besides all that, um, I thought I got rid of this. Somehow it got left on the slide. You, don't, you aren't responsible for any of this here. We do have some spaces sitting in between these meningeal layers, um, but there isn't anything clinically important that you need to know here. Uh, for psychology, that is. Now, this is a cross-section view of the spinal cord. We can see here's the body of our vertebrae. So it, this would be toward the front of our body, and this would be the back. So here's that spine sticking out of our vertebrae. 
And if you look at the middle, this is our spinal cord. Remember that you have the gray matter in the middle with all the cell bodies and the surrounding white matter has myelinated axons. And from there, we're gonna have these roots that extend on out. And when these roots come together, they make up your spinal nerve. So those 31 pairs of spinal nerves that we just discussed, that's what's being created here. And that's going to exit out of the, um, the actual bony vertebrae. So here's that same view. It's a cross section. Here's the gray matter surrounding white matter here. We have our roots or rootlets coming on out from the spinal cord. We also have this ball here. If you remember from Monday, this is our uh, ganglion. This is specifically called the dorsal root ganglion. Um, we'll touch more on this in the coming slides, but we do have cell bodies in here. And remember, these roots come together to create our spinal nerve. Don't worry so much about this picture. It's just talking about tracks ascending and tracks descending. By these tracks, it just means these bundles of nerves that are moving up and down the spinal cord. Okay, so more on our roots. From our spinal cord, we have a dorsal root extending on out. Dorsal meaning back. So this root is coming out more toward the back side of our spinal cord. And this is our ventral root. Ventral meaning belly. So this is more toward the front of our body. And the reason I'm having you guys learn these roots is because we have specific neurons that are found in here. We can only find sensory neurons in our dorsal root, and we can only find motor neurons in our ventral root. What does that mean? That means we only have information coming in on this side, so our indoor, going over to our spinal cord, making connections to other neurons, and then out, our outdoor is the ventral root. And then they come together at the mixed spinal nerve at the very tip. We call this a mixed spinal nerve because it's going to have both motor and sensory neurons in there. Now let's touch on our dorsal root ganglion again. So we said that our dorsal root contains a sensory neuron. Within our dorsal root ganglion, we're going to have cell bodies. And of course, because we only have sensory neurons in here, this means our dorsal root ganglion has sensory cell bodies, or you could say cell bodies of unipolar sensory neurons. Don't worry so much what unipolar means. It's just a structural classification of what kind of neuron this is. So you can cross that out if you want. I'll cross it out for you. Um, so only sensory information in the dorsal portion of the spinal cord. This sensory information comes on in. It can either move up or down the ascending or descending tracks in the spinal cord, or what usually happens, especially in a reflex, is we communicate with an interneuron and then to a motor neuron, and that information gets carried out. Or this uh, sensory neuron communicates directly with the motor neuron without having an interneuron here, and we'll move on out. All right, uh, reflexes. So this is basically what we were talking about in that last picture. So we have to have some type of um, receptor giving us a stimulus to produce a response. Usually this is going to be an automatic response to a stimulus in the case of a reflex without any conscious thought. So we say it's homeostatic. Our components within this, and this is what I drew up on the board on Monday, are going to be sensory receptors, our sensory neuron, to our interneuron, to our motor neuron, and then to our effector organ. So here's that image. We have receptors within our skin. So um, doesn't give us any specific scenario here, I don't think. Let's say you get a needle prick into your skin. And so your nociceptors, your pain receptors, are going to pick up that information, send it along our sensory neuron, okay, that's going through our mixed spinal nerve here. We have to go through dorsal root or the ventral root. 
If you said dorsal root, you are correct. So that moves on through our dorsal root, and yes, we have the dorsal root ganglion here with the cell body, but we're gonna go on through and synapse at an interneuron, and this can be right within the integration center, which would mean either our spinal cord or brain, and that's exactly where we find this interneuron, is in the spinal cord. That communicates over to our motor neuron here, that's gonna move through our ventral root, Okay, and then out through the spinal nerve over to our effector organ, which is going to be a skeletal muscle. So I'm going to pull back from the needle prick because obviously we want to pull back from painful stimuli. Okay, organization of our spinal nerves. Like we said, we have 31 pairs of spinal nerves. Um, the first pair is going to exit the vertebral column between the skull and C1, which is known as atlas. So just know it's that first one after we pass the foramen magnum. We are going to have eight cervical spinal nerves, 12 thoracic nerves, so 1 through 12, which matches the number of ribs we have, okay? We'll have five lumbar spinal nerves, matches the number of lumbar vertebrae we have. And we have five sacral nerves, and we have one pair of coccygeal, a coccygeal spinal nerve. Um, they're all going to exit out the intervertebral foramina, which I don't think I have a great picture of that. Um, basically, when our lumbar vertebrae are stacked on top of one another, they create a hole. So I can show you guys this in the cadaver lab. It creates a hole and it exits through that hole and that makes sense because foramina means hole, inter means between, vertebral of course refers to vertebrae. Okay now for our branches of the spinal nerve, you know I decided that, um, let's see here, I'm going to kind of come back to this slide. So let's go back to Sorry, I keep flipping back and forth. Let's go back to our image of this spinal cord here. So you know that this is your dorsal root here and your ventral root here, and we see your spinal nerve here, but we don't know what these two things are yet. What these are are rami, and rami or ramus is a fancy word for branch. So they are kind of like tree branches. This one toward the back, Okay, we know this is the back because our dorsal root is there. This is called the dorsal ramus. I'm going to put D ramus, R A M. I don't have my pen with me, so this is sloppy. Dorsal ramus there, and this is our ventral ramus. Okay, so I wanted you get to get a visual of what this looks like as far as our other spinal cord components. Okay, so dorsal ramus and ventral ramus. Remember that they're leading into our spinal nerve and then we branch into the roots and over to our um, spinal cord. So you kind of want to think of this as like a tree. These are the roots of the tree. Here's our trunk of the tree. And these would be the branches of the tree. Isn't it beautiful? Okay, so let's talk about what the dorsal ramus is. This innervates or gives supply to the deep muscles of our trunk, so our torso, and they're responsible for like keeping our posture, any other movements in our vertebral column, and um, the connective tissue and skin near the midline of the back. So anything really having to do with the torso, having to do with the back, that information is moving through the dorsal ramus. Our ventral ramus is going to innervate everything else pretty much except for the head. So really it's innervating all of our upper limbs and lower limbs. We also have a thoracic region. Um, so this is gonna be the anterior torso more and um, it's gonna involve our intercostal nerves. So let me show you on this next slide real quick. Here's a part of our spinal cord from our thoracic region. You can see that in the little guy here. And extending on out here, these are the intercostal nerves, but they're all coming from the ventral 
ramus. The dorsal ramus is going to move on back, okay, to give supply to those back structures we just talked about. The remaining spinal nerves that we're going to have are ventral rami that are going to give roots to the plexi. Remember what plexus means? It means braid, an intertwining, or like your text says, an intermingling of nerves. And we have quite a few different plexi. I'm not holding you responsible for this cervical plexus, okay, but the other ones, oh, and not this coccygeal plexus, but the other three are important, okay? So our brachial plexus, that's going to give supply to all of our upper limb. That comes from the ventral rami of C5 to T1. And what that means is coming off of, let's see, this is our cervical plexus. Here we go. Coming off of our spinal cord here would be C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. So all of that intertwines. It braids itself to create the brachial plexus. Doesn't that seem so complex? It's, it's really amazing. Okay, sorry, got rid of all my marks on here. But um, next we have our lumbar plexus, and that comes from the L1 to L4 lumbar, excuse me, L1 to L4 ventral rami. And lastly, we have our sacral plexus, which comes from the ventral rami of L4 through S4. So we have a little overlapping here. I'll show you that in an image. Um, and don't worry about these communicating rami. We'll talk about them a little bit more in our autonomic nervous system lecture. Okay, we talked about that already. Again, I forgot to take the slide out here, so don't worry about this cervical plexus. Oh, you know what? No, I left this in here for a reason. There we go. I left this in here because it is important to know that your cervical plexus, you don't have to know the ventral rami, but you should know that it innervates structures in our neck. Um, and the other major thing that I want you to know is that it gives off the phrenic nerve. And the phrenic nerve innervates our diaphragm. So it's very important for breathing. You can follow it along here. Whenever you find a terminal nerve, so maybe we can do this in our cadaver lab um, if they dissected deep enough. But if you follow it back, you could see where the ventral rami is coming from. So I should have chosen another color. That's too blue. So here's my phrenic nerve, and I follow it back to C3. It all makes, also makes a connection at C4, and also C5. So my ventral rami is all branching from these portions of my spinal cord, C3, C4, and C5, to create the phrenic nerve. Now the same thing is happening with our brachial plexus, but this brachial plexus is so complex, it gives off 16 different nerves. You can see I've marked uh, across some of them out, I didn't list all of them here, but the major branches are going to be these here, the axillary, radial, musculocutaneous, ulnar, and median. So. Here's my ventral rami for the brachial plexus, C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. And you could see at different points, we're going to have different nerves branching off, like the long thoracic nerve. We have the um, medial brachial cutaneous nerve, and we have a lateral um, pectoral nerve. We have a upper and lower subscapular nerves. Anyway, all these other nerves you don't have to be responsible for. Um, the ones I do want you to know is axillary nerve. This is going to go and supply our deltoid and also teres minor. Uh, I won't ask you what muscles they supply, but really what areas. So axillary nerve supplies the shoulder. The radial nerve supplies all of the posterior arm and forearm, so all of the back of the arm and forearm. Musculocutaneous supplies all of our anterior arm, so like where your biceps is, all of those muscles there. And median nerve is going to supply majority of your anterior forearm. And ulnar nerve supplies majority of your hand. And some, some uh, 
forearm muscles, 1.5 to be exact. So moving on from there, these, by the way, these are called terminal branches. Um, they're found right at the ends of the brachial plexus and continue down into the arm and forearm to give supply. And so we're going to take a, a look at these branches and where they're going. So once again, here's our axillary um, nerve, and it is giving supply to some muscles in our shoulder like teres minor and the deltoid. They didn't really show the entire muscle here, but that's what it gives supply to. And also, here's the area of skin that it supplies as well. Radial nerve means it continues down the back of the arm and forearm. So it's supplying a ton of muscles here, um, the triceps, um, brachioradialis, extensor carpi radialis longus. Basically, if you look at the back of your hand and you wiggle your hand around, you should see some tendons moving around. That's your extensor digitorum muscle too. It gives supply to that as well. If you extend your wrist, so moving your nails up toward you, um, that is controlled by the radial nerve as well. Those are your extensor muscles. They extend the wrist. And a slew of others that are going to supply the thumb as well. As when you see this pollicis word here, that means thumb. Okay, musculocutaneous. This is, like I said, going to go and supply the anterior arm. So it supplies your biceps brachii, brachialis, and corcobrachialis. These are all muscles in the anterior arm. And ulnar nerve. Remember we talked about compressing that ulnar nerve against your medial epicondyle, and that was hitting your funny bone? So you can truly see the course of this nerve now. And it's going to extend on down through the forearm. Like I said, it only supplies 1.5 muscles in the forearm. That would be your... Um, your flexor carpi ulnaris, and also your flexor digitorum profundus, but it only supplies half of that muscle, so that's why we say 1.5. But it, where it will give most of its supply is in the hand. And lastly, our median nerve. This extends on through the anterior arm, doesn't really supply anything there, and then within the anterior form, it's going to supply majority of the muscles there. So the those tendons we looked at in your wrist, remember I told you guys we're missing palmaris longus in about 25% of the population, that's supplied by the median nerve. So if you're flexing your wrist toward you, that's some of the muscles that it gives supply to. If you curl your fingers into your palm, it supplies those digitorum muscles that are allowing you to do that as well. And it does supply some muscles in the hand like the thenar muscle group. So people that have carpal tunnel syndrome, they'll start to have atrophy of these muscles or shrinking of these muscles because the nerve isn't able to supply them as well. All right, now our lumbar, lumbar and sacral plexus. Again, this, these plexi are going to go and supply the lower limb. Um, usually we'll call this the lumbosacral plexus, like all in one, because they do overlap a little bit at L4, like I mentioned earlier. The major nerves that you should know coming off of this lumbosacral plexus is going to be our obturator nerve, which would be this guy right over here. This really goes to supply the medial thigh, okay, so the inner thigh area. The femoral nerve, which supplies the anterior thigh, so like your quadriceps, if you contract that, that's all controlled by this femoral nerve. Um, we also have tibial nerve, which is going to supply the, well, this division of the sciatic nerve supplies the hamstrings and also the back of your leg. And we have the common fibular, which really doesn't supply much. It'll give branches to other nerves that'll supply the lateral and anterior compartments of our leg. So notice that our sciatic nerve, that is actually a combination of the common fibular nerve and the tibial nerve. So these two nerves come together to create the sciatic nerve. It's one of the, it actually is the largest nerve in our body. It's about the thickness of your thumb. And I'm hoping, most likely, we will be able to see this in the cadaver lab. It's just amazing. So here is our obturator optor nerve going and supplying those medial thigh muscles or um, inner thigh muscles. Here's your femoral nerve going and supplying. We have some pelvic muscles here like the iliopsoas muscle, sartorius um, is going to go across like this, and then those quad muscles here, the quadriceps femoris. 
And like I said, tibial and common fibular nerves, they're going to come together and they're known as the sciatic nerve. So here we, we really don't separate those two branches, but here's our tibial nerve. It's going to continue down as the sciatic nerve. Um, in this area, we just call it the sciatic nerve because it's coursing right along the common fibular nerve. So we call it sciatic nerve up until about the back of the knee. Then it's really going to separate itself and becomes its own tibial nerve and gives supply to all of the back of the leg and also the foot. And here's our common fibular nerve. Like I said, in this area, we just call it the sciatic nerve because it courses with the tibial nerve. And then once we get to uh, behind the knee, it's going to separate out. And it actually divides into two separate nerves. It divides into the deep fibular and the superficial fibular nerves. So the superficial will go and supply the lateral leg whereas the deep fibular, that'll go and supply the anterior leg. Um, and I forgot to mention that you see this peroneal in parentheses. That's the older term for this nerve. Now everyone's moving over to fibular as being the newer term. So you should know both because some people still, usually the older folks working in healthcare, are going to use the word peroneal to refer to this nerve. So that's it for chapter 12. Um, go ahead and continue to watch the chapter 13 screencast, and then I will see you in the cadaver lab on Wednesday.